Hello, and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. Today I'm being joined by Paul Hoppy as we discuss the question of what happens when you kill the bad guy. Sometimes everything goes back to normal, but a lot of times that bad guy is part of a larger system. And what happens when the bad guy is dead, but the system still exists? Who are the heroes who pay attention to this? Who are the heroes who maybe focus a little bit too much on just get rid of that one guy? All this and more right after the commercial break we have no control over. Welcome back. I'm Matthew. I'm your host. I'm joined by a frequent guest and former co-host, Paul Hoppy. Paul, how are we doing tonight? We're good. Yeah. We're good. Happy birthday. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it is currently no longer my birthday when we're recording oh. this where I am, but it's still my birthday where you are because exactly. time is wiggly, jiggly stuff. So, exactly. sure. Yeah, I'm excited for this topic. And, Paul, I'm really glad to have you on, especially because now I know you now have a, a Twitch stream uh, that we're going to have you talk about at the end, because I know Paul's been creating some great videos about chess and poker and other cool things. Um, but I do want to start by just taking a minute to talk about the, um, the the real sad thing that happened just a couple days ago that impacts um, you know, just across fandom, uh, and that's the death of Chadwick Boseman. Um, obviously an incredible actor who um, has been in a number of wonderful things, some of which I've gotten to see in the last couple of days, because I decided to you know take some time and, and watch some more of his movies. But obviously for us in fandom and as geeks, I think um, Black Panther is the first thing that comes to mind for us. Uh, and it's, you know, when, when I'm generally not someone who is heartbroken when I hear about someone who makes art that I love in their 70s or 80s passing away. But, you know, when someone that young passes away and you had no idea it was coming and, and you know, I think most of us were still kind of waiting for a Black Panther movie, it, it definitely hits pretty hard. Um, so, yeah, Paul, what, what were your kind of feelings when you heard that news? I mean... First shocked and sad, you know, whenever anyone that young dies, it's always yeah. surprising, right? Especially, oh, just like when you later find out that they've been sick for years while they were creating yeah. all this stuff that you loved and that brought, you know, joy and fulfillment to so many people. Um, on, on a personal note, he is about our age or was. Yeah. Um, I mean, as of today, I'm 43 yeah. and he passed away at 43. Yeah. yeah. And... That's- was definitely high on my on my mind as I thought right. about all this. Right, and he actually died of what my father died of at about the same age. Um, oh wow! So yeah, so it's just a little kind of personal. I don't. Know. But um, yeah, I mean, just at a time when there's just like so much, um, just really awful stuff going on in the world, and you know, just like thousands of people dying every day from just, yeah, you know, um, it. To, to me, um, just one thing that it made me think about is, like, that there are probably always going to be tragedies like this one, mm-hmm. and there's probably not that much we can do about it. And um, to me, it kind of underscores just how enraging all of the just completely avoidable tragedies in the world. Yeah, I think it's know? a very good way of thinking about it, you know, like... And, and even there, you know, I, we have no idea. Um, I, I saw a couple posts that said, you know, anytime a black man dies too early, you have to wonder, you know, about racial disparities in healthcare. And certainly, of course, you know, Chadwick getting to the point where he was in his career, I'm sure, had far better healthcare than you or I, right. let alone most people of any race. But you know, you don't know what happened earlier in his life and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, he he as an actor and the role he played in the MCU is particularly significant for for what this podcast is all about. Because, you know, obviously what we like to talk, we like to take movies that people think of as silly and just full of explosions and pretty men with their shirts off and whatever it is and and go deeper into the ethical questions they raise. And I think a number of MCU movies have raised them. Uh, You know, certainly some of the ones we've talked about have raised questions about like accountability and things like that. But Black Panther is a movie that I think really moved the bar in terms of how serious a Marvel movie could be, you know, in terms of how much it decided to say, like, we are going to be addressing racism, Mm -hmm. not, not directly in terms of like, this is a movie about dealing with racist people, but in terms of, you know, challenging the idea that if a, if a black hero is in Hollywood, it's because he's the one star in a movie where everyone else is white, you know, and to really give us this world entirely of black people in Wakanda and to show us like the inner workings of that and, and Afrofuturism and, and so much like, you know, he was involved with something that I think is so resonant for what, what I most care about about these movies. And that's something that I'm, I'm, 
you know, kind of most sad about because I really loved what he was able to do with that. Yeah, for sure. And um, I think one probably kind of sort of unfair and kind of entitled thing that a lot of people might be thinking is like, well, what's, you know, what's going to happen to the Black Panther franchise yeah. now, basically. Um, and I mean, that's, you know, that's a legitimate question. And I, I don't, I don't have any answers for that. Uh, but I, I'm kind of glad that he, you know, if he chose not to tell people, you yeah. know, that he was sick, because like, I, like, would they have given him the role? If, you yeah. know, I don't know. Uh-huh. And he was just, he was, he just, just crushed it. And, um, and I, 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 from one thing I've been hearing, like, I know that, you know, stars of action, mo- stars of big movies often have to have a medical check mm. for insurance purposes. Right, right. And so the version of the story that I've been hearing that I think makes the most sense is that Marvel did know about this. Okay. Um, uh, you know, made me totally wrong. I don't know. Um, certainly I know the, the reasons that I've heard as to why he did not want to tell people, um, this is, I think the, the family put this out, yeah. was that he was, A, he was concerned that, um, every interview he ever gave from right. then on, it would just be about this. Yeah. Um, and also that people might feel bad that, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't know how I'd feel going to watch a movie where I knew like the person was dying and had, you know, pushed, like, I think I would be fine with it, but I, I, I think he wanted, he wanted people to just enjoy his art for the art purpose. Right, right. Um, yeah. I mean, personally, I like to know as little about actors' personal lives as possible to be able to, like, see them as the characters they play. Like, yeah, basically exactly. separate the art from from the, the person as, like, you know, I mean, there's actors that I find things about and it makes me really respect them. And there's actors that I find things out about and <laughs> not so much. And, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't know. I haven't seen The Usual Suspects m- lately. I think it's one of the best movies ever made. But, yeah. like... You know, I don't know. Like, I don't want to be thinking about certain people involved with it. And, yeah. and um, you know, and th- th- that's not to say that, you know, anything like this, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it can maybe interrupt kind of the suspension of disbelief, right? But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if Marvel was aware of that and they were like, yeah, we're good, um, you know, just kudos to them for just yeah. taking the, you know. I mean, someone who is perfect for the role, regardless of anything else going on. Exactly, and and I do like the comment you started before about the entitled comment because I think it's it's easy for us as fans to start thinking only in terms of like how does this affect me, right, right. Um, and I think you know the conversations about what to do next are are interesting. I think now a couple of days later, I'm ready to start having them. When I saw like you know the f- someone would post about his death, and the first comment on it was, well, who gets to, who's going to be recast as him. Um, I, I felt a little, I was like, yeah, yeah. Let, let's have a day or two and just, just mourn. Yeah. The phrase um, too soon comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, it's funny what you said about not knowing much about the actor. It's funny. I, I, I really only thought of Chadwick Boseman in terms of this role. Like I'd seen him in a couple other things. I saw mm-hmm. him in 42 as Jackie Robinson, but for yeah. me, he is Black Panther. And like I said, because of this, I, I went and watched some other of his movies. One of which was, um, get on up, which mm-hmm. have you seen? No. It, it's a very good movie. His performance is amazing, and especially because he's playing James Brown. James Brown, right, yeah. And then James Brown is a celebrity who was in his twilight years when I was young, but, but certainly was very much around. And I was wondering, like, what would, would, I, would I feel like the whole time I was watching Black Panther play Jackie, <laughs> you know? Right, right. And, and that wasn't what happened in the slightest. No, you know, no. it, was, it was, to me, it was like he completely lost himself in the role, and... I mean, James Brown was not a great person, like he, an amazing right. musician who yeah. did incredible things and overcame terrible things. But anyway, that's all just to say to the to the power of him as an actor. Yeah, um, I, I, I most recently saw him in, in Defy Bloods and re- really in, enjoyed the movie overall. And he, I don't know, he's kind of got this sort of mythical sort of uh, presence in, in that movie. Mm, but Nice. Yeah, which is I, similar I, but different from yeah. Shaw. I have seen that. I have not seen that. I really want mm. to. Um, well, and so... Um, a couple of days have passed, so maybe we can't ask this, or maybe everyone's going to think we're being totally grisly. But um, what what is your thought on like? Do do you want to see Black Panther recast? Do you want them to uh, just end the line? Like, what what would you want to see happen? <laughs> um, I mean, the funny answer is like Terrence Howard, right? Because he yeah. was like, <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I'm really not a fan of recasting. Like, generally speaking, yeah. Um, I you know, I mean, obviously, you can't like you know, Princess Leia or General Tark in it, right? Like, for a whole right. movie. Um, it, given, like, where the character is in the, you know, in the story, 
It seems like you can't... Like, there's... There would be certain characters you could be like, yeah, we'll just say that something happened to this character or whatever and then have, like, a new Black Panther or, you know, like, a new character, right? But it's, like... Right. It, it's not that part of T'Challa's arc, right? Like, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you can do besides recasting. Um, but, like, maybe, like, wait a little longer, you yeah. know? Instead of just, like, bulldozing ahead, be like, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna give it another year or so. I don't know. It's a really, really tough spot. And, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, a theory that I think I... I think this may be possible, again, based on the idea that if Marvel knew, is that um, they kind of always, like, because I remember when people said the next Black Panther movie was coming out in 2022, a lot of folks were like, why are you waiting so long? Like, this is so popular. Get this oh, out sooner. Interesting. And, and, and so part of me wonders if they kept it on the slate in part, like, at his request so that people wouldn't start wondering, like, why isn't it on the slate? Right. Um, and, and so I wonder if Marvel has been already in talks about what to do about this and you know, in my dream world, like, you know, uh, Chadwick got to be a part of that conversation and say, yeah. like, here's what I would want you to do. Yeah. Um, we found out recently that Ryan Coogler didn't know, um, which would make sense under HIPAA rules. Like, no one's allowed to tell him. But it, it, it does make that theory feel a little worse if, like, he was writing a movie that everyone else knew was never going to happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's but like, cool. I mean, either way. Yeah, yeah, we uh, hope they uh, at least get paid. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think I definitely am on, like, I don't want to see him recast. I don't want to see anyone else in the role. Yeah. Um, I could see, like, Shuri taking over, um, mm -hmm. though I kind of also like the idea of her being the next Iron Man because she's so much into tech. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I could see that. But I, I think, like, I, I mean, I think by the rules of, of Wakanda, she's sort of next in line. Um, but, you know, who knows? It's it's it it's going to be a hard question. And I, I think I like your idea, what you're saying, like, like, taking some time and letting things settle and seeing, like, where are things going to go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think even just taking, like, making good movies that make coherent sense in the MCU-verse, like, wait, that's redundant, um, <laughs> <laughs> universe-verse. Um, yeah. Kind of like DC Comics. Right, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly like DC Comics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, now I just have to not list all the, like, pin number examples. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, what were we talking about? Yeah. Um, I, I th it's like, where do you go after Endgame? I mean, I, I feel like uh, Far From Home, the you know, the second Spider-Man movie, was a really nice kind of, like, uh, denouement, sort of, like, yeah. of, of phase three and a half. I don't know. Was that four or was that three? I don't even know. Um, I think it was phase four, but yeah, whatever it was. But, like, whatever comes next, I you know, they've basically set things up to do things really differently going forward. And the frustrating thing is, like, it seems like Black Panther was so logically logically going to be such a large part of that, right? So, yeah. you know, it, I mean, if they basically, I, I don't know. I mean, as, as, like, a if I were running the whole thing, like, I would probably have something happen to the character off screen have like mm -hmm. start the second black panther movie with like a funeral for t'challa or something and like yeah. sort of as like a little bit of a like homage you know to, to chadwick and yeah i don't know it, it's very upsetting like it's i don't know yeah like, I'm... it's hard to think about and i think it's it's for us as fans it's a nice moment to remember like yes these these actors create stories for us and that's how how we feel about it but yeah. they're still real people you know and they yeah. can have you know difficult moments in life and and moments of triumph and moments where we kind of really judge them and and they can also just have tragedies like this and yeah. um you know i think i'll be curious to see where it goes and i um certainly something will be will be following on um yeah i mean the art created lives forever right but the, the people yeah. who create it don't so exactly yeah i think it's a great way of putting it um, so with that, let's let's kind of go back to our our main topic. Although I think we're going to talk about Black Panther as one of the examples. Um, and what we're talking about is this idea of the difference between a vis a villain and a system. And, mm. and what I mean, by, like, to give an example, is people often talk today about the difference between are we fighting racists or are we fighting systemic racism? You right. know, and you know, it, it's it's kind of the concept of like you can punch the leader of the uh, Ku Klux Klan in the mouth as many times as you want. The Ku Klux Klan is still going to exist. Right. Um. And 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 I think this is true in in many cases. And you know, in in Iraq, certainly, you know, we we, we killed Saddam Hussein and, and chaos ensued. You know, there, there, there's so many problems continued. 
And this is something that I think comes up a lot in the stories that we care about, because often, you know, it, it's hard to punch systemic racism in the mouth. It's hard right. to punch fascism in the mouth. It doesn't make a good story. You want a personified villain who is like a name and a face as the person you're rooting for the character to, to take down. Yeah. And I get that from a storytelling perspective, but I think it, it leads to this really interesting question of, well, okay, what comes next? You right. know, um, we've killed the emperor. What what do we do now? You know, yeah. what happened to the all the other people who still believed in this? Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting question to talk about which are the shows or movies that, that get into this, which are the ones that, that maybe do a bad job of it, and which are the ones that um, I just totally ignore it. Um, and so this was an idea you had. So what, what for you made this topic so interesting? Um, so I think from a real-world perspective, you know, there's it's very tempting to look at something like, oh, you know, we have an election coming up. We'll just vote out the fascist in chief, and then everything will be great and return to normal or whatever. Um, but I mean, but beyond, you know, you know, America's current crises, um, like just throughout history, you get, um, you know, you get an oligarchy, basically, whether it's a monarchy, whether it's whatever it is, right, whatever right. the system of government is. And then it generally like wealth inequality gets so extreme or tensions rise so high that eventually the oligarchy usually gets overthrown in some manner. Sometimes right. there's guillotines, sometimes <laughs> not, right? Yeah. But like after that, you often get a bunch of chaos, right? Like the reign of terror, if we're sticking with the guillotines. Um, and then often you'll get some person showing up like Napoleon or whatever, being like, oh, I will restore order, but you all have to do exactly what I say. And I'm the only one who can restore order and blah, 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 blah. And yeah. then whether they are successful or whether they have their Waterloo or whatever, like ultimately you just end up with a new oligarchy, it seems like. Right. And then that grows and whatever. And then eventually it seems like rinse, repeat. Um, yeah. And recently having watched um, all four seasons of Legend of Korra in, I don't know, maybe like a two week span, something like that. Uh, after actually having watched season four, in like a terrible pirated format um, and, <laughs> and then watching all four seasons correctly, like on, on Netflix when they came out. Um, I really, I mean, I've, I've got a lot to say about the show, but I won't go in, into all that here. Um, but seasons three and four, I think do some really interesting things that I have rarely to never, I feel like I've, it's probably somewhere, but it doesn't come to mind. Um, but you know, you have, Season three, you have this anarchist, well, right? Yeah, no, go ahead. I, I was gonna, let's this, not get yeah, too much you, into the details okay. of anyone's show yet. I just yeah. want to just start with like the generalities of why this is such an interesting topic. Right. Um, so, okay. Um, so he, here's – it relates to present day um, and basically all time periods because what we have now is extremely widening uh, – escalating wealth inequality, right? Income right. inequality, but I think more importantly, wealth inequality. And that's uh, within the United States and that's global as well, right? And looking at that, like I would like to change that, right? Yeah. But, you know, the question is like, how do you actually do that? And I think one of the reasons in fiction, you always get like, you know, a, a main villain that's like, oh, we'll just defeat them and then everything will be good. Yeah. Is because in real life, we don't have a plan. I mean, yeah. like there are a bunch of, there are, you know, like there's tons of political actions we can take. We can protest, we can boycott things. Like sometimes there's violence in the streets and ultimately maybe there's more violence in the streets when none of those protests are listened to, right? right. Um, but I think the this sort of disconnect between looking at what there is and being like, this is bullshit. And then like actually coming up with a, an actionable plan that enough people will be on board with to create real change that can hopefully be lasting change and not just turn into another oligarchy. Yeah. I, I think it's a really great way to put it, and especially that idea of how do you build the lasting change? Because I think the the dichotomy that we see or the, the sort of the, the pendulum is that fascism or like oligarchy or whatever it is, is terrible and horrible and wrong, but it's also control. 
and mm-hmm. it's you know the 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 Mussolini made the trains run on time kind of nonsense you right. know and and the fact is like you say like well that's awful like look at all the things Mussolini did but then when the trains stop running on time when yeah. businesses can't get the, what they need when there's law like um the Mandalorian actually is one of my favorite examples of this because yeah. most of what the Mandalorian is about is a world in which the empire is no longer in control the new republic is still kind of struggling to take control back and so there's pretty much lawlessness. And that's kind of why people are starting to be like, yeah, I kind of – the Empire sucked, but at least like, you know, like I could order something and it would arrive, you know? Right. Um, and, and I think uh, – I like the point you made about the wealth inequality because, you know, there's a meme that goes around. And I think it's kind of funny It's when it's – different ways it's phrased. But it's basically like, you know, if we could just arrest or, you know, take all the money from or, you know, you know guillotine or whatever it is, you know, the eight richest people in the world, then everything would be okay. Um, and the fact is, like, there's a vice president of Amazon who will take over if Jeff Bezos suddenly right. is, isn't, is you know, a, th- a factor anymore. Right. And we'll run Amazon in basically the same way. You yeah. know, like, we don't – you're not going to stop the problems of the world by, by just overthrowing a couple of people. And I I think it's interesting when, when stories really get to explore that. And as we'll talk about, I think Cora is, is such a good example of that. So so let's do it this way. What What to you would, in a story – Either fighting the system or trying to have a way to re- replace the system. What would that look like in a story? Like, what are, what are the kind of things you want to see so that it's not just let's punch the bad guy enough times that everything will be better? Right. Well, I I think it's impossible to do without having a fairly broad story. Mm-hmm. I I think you need like more than a few characters in yeah. order to really. Um, pull something like that off. I, I, I think it's probably very difficult to do in a movie. Yeah, I uh, think that's fair. I mean, we have an example that we're going to get to, but it, it's almost, it's like implied, right? Um, but we'll get to that. I, I, I want to see character growth. I want to see people changing. I, I want to see sort of how are people living later? Like what, what actually ch- changes? Like, you see a system, maybe it's run by a person, maybe that person's taken down, then someone t- takes over the system. Then how do you go about dismantling that system? But, you know, you can't really get rid of something without replacing it with something new, like basically riding over it. Yeah. Or that thing will come back or something like it will come back. It's like yeah. this empty space. It's a vacuum. Uh, and, you know, people talk about power vacuums, but it's like habits. If you want to get rid of an old habit, the the most efficient way to do that is to replace it with a new habit, right? right. It's like not doing a thing isn't a thing. It's, yeah, I, I remember when people, friends of mine would try to quit smoking. They would yeah. say like, okay, well, but now I'm spending most of my time not smoking, mm-hmm. you know? And like that's that, that right. doesn't work. You need to be doing right. like you're chewing gum instead or you're, you right. know, you're – you're, you know, getting addicted to internet porn or whatever it is, you know, right, like, whatever you know, it is, yeah. something else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Finding, you know, this is sort of my habit and I'm going to replace it with this other habit, you know, hopefully a constructive one. Or, you know, I have, you know, we have this system, um, you know, I mean, when people talk about defunding or abolishing the police, right? Personally, right. I think of myself as an abolitionist, but mm-hmm. at the same time. I look at the world now and I'm like, yeah, you can't just really abolish all the police forces and like, yeah, we're good. Like, that's yeah. not going to work, right? So like, I view it as being as, as like aspirational. Like, how do we get to a point where we don't need prisons, where we don't need, you know, um, police officers? How do we right. get to that world? I don't think we do it in our lifetimes. I think what we do is we build towards that. We try to create positive change. We try, try to create... Um, you know, a society where that's that's not the mechanism for dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, um, acts of violence. Yeah. I very much agree with you there, especially because I think a big part of what ha- what we're talking about is, you know, really generational, like, fundamental changes in attitudes and culture. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things that dictators are able to do, dictators generally rise to power in times of great uncertainty and chaos, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 1930s Germany was just a complete wreck and the depression and 
all this anger about World War One and the reparations, and and people wanted someone to blame, you know. Yeah. And um, in Iraq, when we you know had no real plan to replace it, um, and um, I think I've mentioned this before, but um, there's a lot of uh, I've taken one course in African history. I don't want to claim to be an expert by any means, but there's a lot of great study that's been talked about where a big part of why the problems that many of those countries have had for so long is that the British decided they had an end colonial rule. Mm. So they came to like a point uh, in most countries was 1960 and just said, okay, have a good time right. without, you know, like building any kind of real. And, and the point being that I think so often those things come to power because there's a real fear of the chaos and there's a fear of lawlessness. And mm-hmm. so when the dictator comes along and says, you know, I can take care of this, you know, people want to trust that. Um, v for Vendetta, which the movie we'll talk about later, is a great example of that, where they intentionally generate that fear so that you want the strong person to take to keep you safe. Right. And so often, I think what it has to be is about how do you undo that fear? How do you help people feel safe and feel confident so they don't need that that oligarch? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Or how do you help them develop courage and you know face face the fears? Right. Exactly. Or maybe so, hopefully learn that the fears maybe are not as, you know, are a little bit unfounded in some cases. Yeah. So, so let's get into Legend of Korra a bit. And, and we'll explain a little bit about, about what, what's happening here. Because uh, I think Legend of Korra is a very interesting story in both directions. Because in, actually I should say for Avatar in general. Because in the first series, Avatar, all we care about is Fire Lord Ozai. You yeah. know, all we care about is the leader of the system. And and the implication seems to be that if you kill him or get rid of him, because um, not killing him becomes a major plot point, everything will go back to normal. Um, and that's kind of the conceit of the show, but it doesn't really make sense because the nation's been at war for 50 years before Ozai was born. Um, or at least for a significant amount of time. Like 100, right? Oh, before yeah. Ozai was born. No, you're right. Yeah, it's probably like yeah. 40, 50, 60 um, years. But in Legend of Korra, it seems like they, they kind of get it and they now do really start to replay, uh, to address that. So talk about what it is that Legend of Korra does, what you either liked or didn't like about it. Okay, well, first, in defense of Airbender, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think they do address it. Um, we don't actually get to see the outcome, but mm-hmm. Iroh very deliberately is like, no, I will not go and fight my brother because history would just see this as one brother, you know, fi- fighting with another, feuding with mm, another. That's a good then, point. Right, and so he's like, Zuko, you have to do it. You have to go and fight your sister. I don't know. But like... Um, <laughs> cause the avatar is fighting his father. Right. But Zuko, you have to go and be the new fire prince. And, you know, you've had this redemption arc, like you kind of can go and be a new leader. So they're not like, we're just getting rid of the fire Lord and then whatever, we're good. Like the fact that Zuko came over to team avatar, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> on like the best redemption arc in fiction, but like, yeah. um, it, it, uh, yeah. So there will be some spoilers for. <laughs> The Last Airbender and uh, Korra, um, uh, comma, The Legend of. But, like, the fact that Zuko is, he's the Fire Prince, right? Mm -hmm. He's grown up in, you know, in the, the, the Fire Nation, but then he's seen the world. He's gained perspective. He's also, you know, there's, there's other stuff. But, like, the fact that he can kind of step in and be like, okay, we're going to do this differently and he's still like, we can still be proud to be the Fire Nation. We're just, we're going to, you know, decolonize essentially. And, right. you know, let the Earth Kingdom be the Earth Kingdom. And I'm working together with the Avatar. And it kind of all, I think, I think that's like an important sort of um, coda to the, um, to, to that story. That said, Korra does something very different that I think is awesome and that, just wasn't really a thing in avatar it's like if zuko hadn't been a character who came around to you know team avatar Mm -hmm. i feel like then the last airbender would have had that as a problem as a sort of like at the end you're sort of like okay well i what's going to happen now so so i do want us to get to Korra, but this actually presents a really interesting question which is if you have a system where you have one strong person Mm -hmm. who gives the orders and everybody follows them it seems yeah. like what you're saying is what they do is they manage to replace a bad person in that role with a good person in that role. Yeah. And a good person in that role can take things in a better direction right. and maybe even move to a place where 
you no longer want one strong person in the role. You have much more of a, a representative democracy or whatever right. it is. But I think that, that, that often there's an idea of like, you know, you replace a bad king with a good king. Everything gets better until that good king while. dies and a bad yeah. king replaces them, you know? And like, exactly. I think that's, that's where, I think that's a great example of the, the kind of tension we're at. So, so with that, let's get into Korra. Yeah. Um, and I will say in Korra, one of my sort of disappointments, but I kind of understand it, um, is how little the Fire Nation figures in to any yeah. of the four seasons. Uh, you know, I mean, there's characters who show up and there's people from the Fire Nation, but, you know, there's a couple of, okay, so spoilers ahead. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple of water tribe villains, right? Then there's like a powerless villain who then gets some powers and uses them like the way they were always meant to be used, but shouldn't be used, but like definitely it's good. Um, and then like an Earth Kingdom villain, right? So they kind of like, try to i think sort of like balance that they had the fire nation be like the villains in the first season but then they just kind of have them like all right um but so what cora does that i think is great is they have this horrible you know i don't know whether you use the word dictator for like an authoritarian you know queen or you know an authoritarian i think is the point yeah so you have this authoritarian really from my sense, horrible person and horrible ruler, right? Um, which is established. And then you have someone come in basically from outside who's just, I don't even know if we know where he comes from originally, but, um, you know, Zaheer, right? And he becomes an airbender and he's like, um, you know, he, he just kills her. He just yeah. takes away all of her air. And people need air to live. So that's why airbending is very powerful. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I might have thought of using airbending for that before that show came out. But <laughs> I was like, I would take air because you could just suffocate someone. And then and what are they going to do? Uh, but, and fire, you could, right? You take, okay, anyway. The point <laughs> being, along. there are consequences for that. And I feel like the season kind of goes off the rails a little bit uh, towards the end. And, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not really that into sort of the end of that season but that part of that season i thought was great and i mean like i think he's right you know but he's right but then kind of lacks the bigger picture he's he's sort of got this idea like oh if we just remove all of the the leaders and like he he really should have gone after the republic city president before right. the avatar like <laughs> come on um but because that dude's horrible too but not as horrible but you know, the problem is he's like, it's like one step and then he's like, okay, then there will be, you know, chaos and this is the natural order, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think the point though is that there won't be this oppression. But the problem is there's this enormous system built up. Like this right. oppression isn't this one person, right? It's not like she was like, oh, I'm going to build this huge system just for me. And then if I die, it's just all going to go away. No, it's this hereditary title. You know, the Earth the Earth Kingdom has the Dai Li, which is like worse than, you know, the monarch. Right. Like, should have gotten rid of the Dai Li, you know? <laughs> like, I, I um, mean, it's, in some ways, I think we're going to talk about, like, what happens after the queen dies. Yeah. But the very fact that she's there is part of the problem because... Mm -hmm. In Avatar The Last Airbender, which happens about like 70 or 80 years earlier. Yeah, uh, 70, What's the exact number? Do you so. remember? I believe it's 70. 70. Okay. You know, in that, um, the Fire Nation has taken over the Earth Nation. And so, like, the Earth Nation has a king, or at least did, did at first for a while, who's basically a puppet of that group you were talking about, the Dai Li. Yeah. And a lot of it was about, like, you know, that this is a very broken system. And if you take over the top, you can rule the entire country. And it's really problematic. And so they eventually, like, defeat the Fire Nation, which means the Fire Nation is no longer in control of this Earth Nation system. Right. But the Earth Nation system is still just as bad. And so yeah. even just the fact that this queen comes to power is a sign of, yeah, you got rid of the Fire Nation, but the Earth Nation is still ruled by this, you know, absolute monarchy, and it's still just as much of a problem. And so, of course, a queen like this comes along. Right, exactly. Like, they didn't do the work to, like, yeah. really dismantle the system. And I think they failed to notice... That the Earth Kingdom was that corrupt, that the Earth Kingdom was that much of a totalitarian state, right? Right. Even though, like, it was right in their face. So that's, like, a frustrating thing as far as, like, well, what happened after, you know, right. the last airbender? It's like, you know, Aang dropped the ball on that one. 
Well, um, and, and that one, I think, and, is it's also a commentary on the idea of, like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. You know, and it's, you know, I mean. But we it could still be your enemy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, like, oh. you know, when Stalin helped us fight Hitler, all of a sudden we cared a lot less about, you know, the, the starvation of people in Ukraine. Like, that's, it's a real politique thing, but it's, it's awful when it happens. And I right. think it's, it makes sense to me, but I think it's definitely a failing of the Avatar gang. Yeah, in, in the first series. Yeah, and not in the first series, after the first after series. After the first series, yeah. Right, everything that happens after. And one, one uh, point that I'd note is that when Azula goes in to take over the Earth Kingdom, she doesn't, like, do anything to the Earth King, right? Yeah, she doesn't she, have to. She takes over the Dai Li. Yeah. Like, she takes over the Dai Li. And then through that, she can control, you know, Ba Sing Se. So, I think, you know, she she understands the systems of power, right? She right. understands how power is wielded. And, you know, the fact that they just allowed the monarchs to just continue, and... Actually, that gets us to season four. And to actually skip ahead um, in season four, when they're talking about, you know, at the end of everything, it's like, oh, I guess you'll be king. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Have we learned nothing? Well, and and let's back up a bit. Because I think some folks may not have seen Court originally or or, or, or recently or just aren't quite sure where we're going. I I think what you're getting at is is, um, the the reason why the whole thing about Zaheer killing the Earth Queen is because he wants chaos. But then a good deal of the plot of the next season is about the fact that someone has basically become a dictator in the exact way we're talking about because the people are so angry and frustrated by this chaos that they want someone to, in her words, liberate them. You right. know, And so she comes to bring order and to bring peace and to bring stability. Yeah. And when she phrases it as like, we can't have peace and stability if someone stands against me, people are like, cool, rah, rah, go you. Until they realize she's now just as much of a dictator as the queen was. Exactly. Exactly. And and the thing that I really like about Kuvira as a character um, is that I feel like she re- she has very genuine intentions. Yeah. Like she she wants to make the Earth Kingdom better, right? She yeah. she wants things to be better. Um, and the thing I don't like so much about Kuvira as a character is they get to a point where, you know, some of the other characters are just like, wait, she's crazy, right? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, eh. I, I, I felt a little like of that with Zaheer towards the end of, of <clears throat> season three. Mm-hmm. And then with Kuvira in the middle of season four, where it felt a little bit like, partially like it was convenient for the plot. Like that's how they're going to have a story. Right. Because she's going to get, like, does she get corrupted by power? Like, I, I don't know. It, 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 that didn't, like, play for me as yeah. well. You know? It, I, I, I had to head candidate somewhat. But the way, I, the way it makes sense for me is to think of her very much like Kingpin uh, in the Daredevil okay, TV shows. Okay, yeah. In which, you know, Kingpin, like, I mean, he thinks, you know, he had to kill his own father because his father was abusive and drunk and, and killing his mother, you know, hurting his mother, like physically, yeah, yeah. Um, putting her life in danger, putting his life in danger. And so he kind of has this feeling of like, I need to bring order to the city. And, and then right. in his mind, like, you know, people will have jobs and people won't be alcoholics. And like, he'll avoid, you know, people and like people like his father will either get a better job and have a better life or will get arrested and taken care of. And I do very much believe that until the end of the, you know, until the very end, he always believes that what he is doing is the right thing. He is the hero. But he's both a little bit what you said, drunk on power, but it's also just he you know, he sees the whole world allied against him, because of yeah. course like the systems want to stop him. Right. And so anyone who stands against him, it must be because they're defending the system he wants to take down, you know, and that yeah. it just proves and I think that's what it is, Kuvira, is that she does she gets that myopic, she loses focus, she stops seeing things as they should be. Because in her mind, you know, if you're not with me, you're my enemy. Right. And therefore, you're the enemy of, of the Earth Kingdom and yeah. peace and all that. Hmm. Okay. Okay, I can I can kind of get, you know. Yeah. I, I, can, I can buy that headcanon to an extent. Um, I, I would have liked to see it a little. Yeah, um, I, w- I wish the show had actually told us that or shown right, us that. Right, 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 right. And, and Kingpin, that's the end of season one, right? Until the end of season one. And then, right. Um, then, then he gives a big speech and it's different, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
just a great speech. Uh, but yeah, so I, the end though of of season four of Korra, the sort of the end of the Kavira arc, I think like they take her from point A to point B, and I think that's a little, um, a, if it, that part felt a little shaky to me. But then yeah. towards the end, and then when they kind of bring it back around, I think that works really well, and. Um, you know, sort of the, I don't know, the, the whole process of, of Korra, like, learning from her enemies, you know? Right. Um, I, I think was, was great. And, uh, you know, like, when she goes to visit Zaheer and talks to him, and, and he's like, well, you know, it's like, I think she's like, why would you help me? And he's like, because we're not enemies right now. Like, our yeah. interests are aligned, right? He's like, this isn't what I wanted, you know? <laughs> like. Yeah. Like, I tried to do my thing, it didn't work, and now there's this, and so, like, I'll help you stop this. Yeah. Um, but then, then, then after they defeat her, then they're like, oh, I guess Prince Wu will be the king, and it's like... Yeah, well, and there, I think, <sighs> one thing I, I, that, that character drove me crazy a lot, but what I love is that he ends it by saying, no, I don't want that, yeah. let's make, let's have a democracy, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Which is so really... I can be a singer. Yeah. And, and it's funny, because we were, um... Uh, we talked about Black Panther, obviously, to honor uh, Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. But I think that's an, that that movie is another interesting example in in a different direction because there, what you have is kind of what we were t- we were talking about how like you know if the system is in place that uh, um uh you know you kill the bad person and replace them with a good like it doesn't really help anything. <clears throat> we see that because in in Wakanda. You have a system where the th- the idea is that, as long, that it will always be a good person in that role so we can give right. them absolute power right. uh, or almost absolute power. The whole point of the movie is that when the the king is killed, uh, at least we, everyone thinks so, and right. replaced by this guy who hasn't been in Wakanda you know, ever in his life. Yeah. Or at least uh, defeated, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, defeated, yeah. certainly. Uh, but I think they think he's dead, at least. It, right, the, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He falls that, off a cliff. That now Probably. all these people have to obey, you know, uh, Killmonger. Right. And right. because that's just... And some of them run away and some of them fight, but some mm-hmm. of them are – and some of them believe in him, but some of them are just like, you know, he's the king. He ordered right. us to, to burn the, the, the heart-shaped flower. You know, that's right. what we have to do. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's like putting aside all the stuff about who plays who, I really hope we get to a point in the Wakanda storyline where someone is saying like, yeah – maybe the system needs to have a few more safeguards because like if it's right. that easy for one person to be like, Nope, now we're attacking the whole world. That's a problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like dude shows up. He's like, Oh, I killed this guy. Okay, cool. I'm challenging you to combat. Okay. Oh, I defeated you. Now uh, let's go make war on the world. And mm-hmm. like, you know, a bunch of people like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, but it's like they're doing the same thing they were doing before. They're following orders, mm-hmm. and yeah. as history has shown, that can be problematic. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, what are other examples? So, yeah, I think I think you're right. The Korda is a very good example of you know not perfect, but of showing the heroes being very aware of this and, and showing the consequences of when they're not. Um, and I definitely have some other examples of things that I think do a good job of this. Um, what do you think an example of a story or a hero or a character who who doesn't put the thought into this and where? you wished the story had shown us the problems with that. Hmm. Or they don't. I mean, I feel like the original Star Wars trilogy, it's like, we're just going to defeat the Emperor and blow up the Death Star, and then it's like, yay, we win. Yeah. Um, I, tr- I, yeah. I, I mean, in a little bit, they, they don't, because, like, you know, I think a lot of times, if the movie just ends, if it's just A New Hope, right. then you certainly have a problem, because it's like, okay, the Empire, which was already totally in control... Yeah. Just built a weapon to be even more in control. Right. So we blow up that weapon, they're still just as much in control. And I love yeah, that yeah. Empire shows that. But you're right. I think the the idea at the end is like, all right, we you know, we, we kind of won the battle and we blow up their new Death Star, but they still have all those Star Destroyers out there. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Um Yeah, I, I think Star Wars is a good example. Um But I think it's unfair to pick on it. Like I, I feel like just the yeah. vast majority of action movies or adventure movies like that's kind of if there's a main villain running things then they get defeated then everyone's like yay and it's like is that is are things really going to be fine like yeah you know like i mean batman kills raj al ghul the league of shadows is still just as strong and just as much of a problem you know yeah. um you have all these examples i think where uh, i'm trying to think of any other uh specific he didn't ones kill him he didn't uh save him <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, sin of omissions. Um, I have some thoughts on that, to be sure. But, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying because I think you're right. I mean, it is so overwhelming. I'm trying to think of others, especially in the kind of like MCU or DC canon uh, recently. Because um, I, I do think we do have some stories where, and I'm not sure this is realistic necessarily, but where in the story, at least, I believe that if you kill the leader, everything's okay. You know, like. Right. Thanos has minions, but none of them are going to be wanting to do the same thing, you know? And, like, mm. the Joker... like Well, they also st- snaps literally all of them out of existence, right? So. Right. I mean, also yeah. true. But, like, you know, the Joker is, like... Mm. We yeah. without the Joker, there's going to be crime in Gotham. Right. But he definitely... Insp- like, the, the Joker is never going to have a lieutenant who'll just take over exactly where he yeah. is. Yeah. Um, well, and to the credit of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, like... You know, Raish died, but the League of, I guess they called it Shadows, right. um, did not. Yeah, no, that's right? true. That's actually I mean, that's, the point. That's the plot. Like, that's the whole point, right? It's like, it's like, yeah, that wasn't it for that. Like, he didn't destroy that organization. You yeah. Know? Um, he defeated their plan and, you know, their leader at that time. But that wasn't that wasn't the end of the organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, that the totally makes sense. Yeah, so um, that, you know... Actually, that's, I mean, they, there's like Batman Begins, right? And then in the Dark Knight, things are still really bad in Gotham, right? Right. Um, And then, you know, then there's the Joker. And I guess, like, somehow by getting Gordon to be seen as, like, really heroic, then they were able to, like, end corruption in Gotham for a while right? or something. Um, although that was like the criminal corruption, they still had capitalist corruption and right. massive wealth inequality, which Catwoman pointed out. Yeah, and Bruce Wayne is certainly not a... Uh, he's very much a part of that. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and yeah, and I, I think it's a really good point. Like, I think one reason I like Dark Knight so much is that Batman doesn't just want to beat up criminals in that. He wants to... Right. Like, to me in that one, he wants to create a world in which Batman isn't necessary anymore. Um, right, exactly. which is a, a, a nice idea. Yeah, um, I'm sure we'll think of more in that direction, but I wanted to kind of touch on some of the ones that I think also do a good job of this. And, and yeah. one you kind of we, we mentioned briefly is V for Vendetta. Yeah. Um, what what uh, is more than one I brought up, but I'm curious. Like since I've been talking a lot, what to you what makes V for Vendetta a good example of the kind of stuff we're talking about? Um, I felt like I was talking a lot. That seems backwards. <laughs> I feel like we're both supposed to feel like the other person's talking a lot. Yeah. But actually be talking a lot. Yeah, but. exactly. <laughs> anyway, V for Vendetta, great movie. We did an episode on it, right? Yep, very good. Um, did we have Logan along for that? I think yeah, we did. we did. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so in V for Vendetta, V uh, basically has a vendetta. And, <laughs> you know, there's there's a, a, a fascist government, right? And he wants to overthrow it because that government's evil and oppressive, but also because he hates them. Like, yeah. on a very deep personal, they've done him wrong. Yeah. And he has so a vendetta, quite literally. He has a vendetta, exactly. Um, and he, the way he goes about it, though, is like, yeah, I'm going to lure this guy down into the, you know, the underground and, like, kill him with a knife, right? But I'm also going to try to convince the people that, you know, there's hope that they can have freedom, that they should, that they can stand up for themselves and actually yeah. make change. And I think he sort of wins the like hearts and minds battle mm-hmm. while kind of like by making the government bleed a little bit, right? Yeah. He blows some stuff up to basically show like, Hey, look, this symbol of power is bullshit. I'm going to take it down but like you need to be able to take it from here because I'm not it's like I'm not going to become king or something right yeah like and he knows and there's not necessarily a lot of thought for what will happen after that you know there's an extent to which V is Zahir you know yeah he's he's to an extent an anarchist he's like I'm going to tear down the system now you all have to do better. And it's just right. like, it's on you. And like the Earth Kingdom didn't do better because the Earth Kingdom had been living under, you know, a horrible, or not necessarily horrible, but they, you know, this kind of big oppressive empire for years, for centuries, right? For tons mm-hmm. of time. Um, 
And li like the, the, what's his name? Mako and Bolin's grandma, like, takes the picture of the queen. This horrible yeah. queen. She's like, I gotta take the picture with me. Like, oh, her highness. You know, that's real, right? Yeah, uh, it very much is. And I think it's a very realistic thing. I, I do, though, I, I think Zaheer and, and V are fundamentally different for exactly the reason you talk about, which is, yeah. we were talking earlier about how you kind of have to, you know, rebuild the culture and yeah, yeah. and that's what v does i think mm -hmm. if v had just killed the bad guy you know in yeah. that tunnel yeah it would be exactly like the earth kingdom but instead what v does is all you know all the stuff you laid out he gets the people to realize the government isn't untouchable mm -hmm. he gets them to understand the power of organizing and of like claiming back their their freedoms um yeah. and it helps that here's a country where it's not like the, the earth kingdom wasn't a democracy in the past. It's always been right, a monarchy. And right. I think that's yeah, a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. Here you're talking about people who in their living memory, the country was something different. Yes. Um, but he... I, I, so there's I, something they can kind of try to go back to. Right. Essentially. And, and what, what he does is he gets people to remember that. He gets the people yeah. to, to see that they don't have to be afraid. And I, right. it, it's why I love that movie so much and why I think the fact that he very violently kills the, the, the leaders, but that the, the people non-violently yes. kind of take over from everything else you know yes. that yes. that to me is because it's saying like we're not just the next dictatorship we're we're changing things we're right. break, we're breaking this cycle in the system yeah i mean first of all like he plays music for them right and i think yeah. like it's like music illegal or something in that, yeah right um and he yeah like he's like I, th I think it's a really kind of good hybrid, right? Of like, mm -hmm. these people, these individuals are a problem. They built this system, right? Like, they were the architects of it. Um, they created the disaster that then they, like, saved people from. Right. They created the fear, right? They built the fear. So he's going to eliminate those people, basically, like, excise them. Um, and that, But then the the people have to do something after that. And the people then not, they just all show up and the soldiers are like, stand back or we're going to shoot all of you. And, but there's just tons of them and they're all anonymous, right? They're, yeah. they're um, wearing those masks from anonymous. Um, I, <laughs> I know that's up. <laughs> um, but like, and then the, the soldiers or police, or it's hard to tell, um, which I guess is a commentary on mm -hmm. the real world too. Uh, they're just like they just stand down because yeah. the leaders are not there to tell them to do the bad things basically right and whether or not that's how things would exactly play out in our world i don't know i would like to hope so i have question you know suspicion. Yeah. but like but the point being that it's like it's this it's direct action by an individual against other individuals combined with massive Nonviolent protests by just tons of people right. standing up and being like, "Look, this isn't. It's not going to be like this anymore." Yeah, um, and it's it's very powerful. Yeah, I, I think it's such a good example of like because you're right. Like it often, the problem is that you have a system in place, and then an, an individual comes along, and you know finds a way to exploit the system and kind of take it to its worst successes. Right. Um, you know. Where like it's always been bad, but this person just does the worst things they possibly can with it. Um, right. I'm talking like totally about fiction. You know, this oh. doesn't happen in the real world in <laughs> no, any way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, I think it's just such an interesting thing because, you know, in View for Vendetta, they they really do. He's able to change that mindset entirely. Um, right. Another example that I wanted to mention of this, um, mostly because it's it, it's really just about like, nope, the system is always there. You can't change it. Um, and we're, we're we're getting out of the sort of superhero realm, but it's certainly one I think beloved mm. by a lot of our our fans. Uh, the Wire, yeah. you know, The Wire to me, th that's the central message of all of it. It's that you know, whether you're a rival gang or the police, you get it into your head that you can arrest someone or you can shoot someone or you can take down that person, but there's always going to be someone who comes next. You know, yeah. it's just it, the, and there's no way to stop that without the fundamental systemic change that no one wants to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's always a new asshole cop. There's always a new drug dealer. There's always a new junkie. There's always a new Omar. I don't know yeah. what to call him. Um, but, you know, it's and that's that's I think the, the thing that's so brilliant about the, the end of the show, especially because they kind of like show, you know, where the cycle then can just it yeah. just 
it just marches on. You know? Yeah, all and, these people are being replaced, but the, the exactly. systems, and, and it's because, like, the people in power refuse to acknowledge that and, and try to actually change the system itself. Exactly. exactly. Um, yeah, because they're all, they're all usually acting out of their own self-interest and also just in their own field of view, yeah. right? Yeah, like, I guess that's where I put it. It's hard to see the whole system. It's like when there's when you've got today's problems in, in front of you, it's hard to like have perspective on the past and look past like the next election if you're right. Littlefinger or Carcetti, um, or you know. <laughs> uh... I mean, it's basically the same character, you know. Like right, right, Carcetti exactly. doesn't actually own whorehouses and kill people in quite the same way, but <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I'll say one other example, a much lighter one, but one that I think actually makes this point pretty well, I mean, by the basic name of it, um, and it's the organization of Hydra in, in the MCU. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, because the whole point of a Hydra, and yeah. sometimes the stories get this, and sometimes they kind of ignore it. I but, feel like they kind of jumped the Hydra in uh Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it, the theory is supposed to be that, like, you cut off one head and two more grows back. Right. Um, and you de- especially in the show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I think they do get that idea pretty well of, like, mm-hmm. our heroes keep thinking they've defeated the head of Hydra, but, like, there's just more, you know, because right. the system yeah, yeah. is so much deeper than that. Yeah. Shouldn't you just stab it in the heart, then? <laughs> that would seem to be the right idea, right? I'm, I mean, I think <laughs> the idea is that when the heads are on the end of, like, 15-foot necks, you know? Right, right, right. And no, they're always trying to bite you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I played D&D. I yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's a real so. hassle. It's a real hassle. <laughs> It definitely is. It definitely is. Petrify, petrify, <laughs> petrify. That 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 could be a good strategy. Not so much but, in our world. <laughs> yeah, not so much. In our, well, you know, don't knock it to try. Um, I yeah, I, I that, that's that's a really good example because like you know Hydra, the first Captain America. I mean, honestly, it took me by surprise, right? Uh, the the first Captain America film, Hydra's the main villain, you know, but like. The main villain is is Red Skull, right? Right. And then, oh, Red Skull's defeated. Hydra's gone. Cool. Uh, not so fast. And, yeah. you know, then in the second one, it's like, you know, in Winter Soldier, it's like, oh, Hydra's, Hydra's shield. Fuck. And then, like, okay, now Hydra's defeated, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not so fast. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's like, that's how, you know, malignant organizations i mean and that's that's an organization that's like a secret organization and doesn't have like an official bureaucratic purpose right Right. organizations that do have clear bureaucratic purposes i mean like if we get back to the police for a minute it's like yeah how are you going to abolish the police like well there's a lot of thoughts about that but it's like people think about police and they think about you know who they call when certain things happen right right um now the idea that that prevents these things from happening doesn't make a lot of sense because then you would never call them because these things wouldn't happen. But like, but there is a very real like, yeah, well, what am I going to do if this happens, if that happens, right. whatever. Um, yeah, cause I, and, I oh, go ahead. No, just, and so kind of, you know, being like, yeah, we're just going to disband the, the entire police department, which I know some places have done. Another and but then they've like created a new one, right? But you know the idea of like yeah maybe starting from scratch and kind of reimagining what a thing is, um, but it's like that's hard because yeah. people people have you know it's like when you think about archetypes, right? Or you think about like you know the top ten job titles that like a kid learns, like the first ten job titles that a kid learns, like cop is probably one of them. Right, yeah. like doctor, cop, firefighter, like teacher, lawyer, yeah, right, like yeah, freelance lighting designer, you know, those are <laughs> <laughs> train conductor, podcaster, um, oh. <laughs> podca- exactly, exactly, uh, streamer. I mean, that's actually something that kids probably do find earlier these days because yeah. you know games, but but yeah, it, it's like it's something that's sort of so iconic and so built into the like psyche of like how of people's like notion of how the world works that i think there's a sense that that's like the way the world has to work because that's the way it's worked for all of our lives yeah it's like well that's not necessarily the way the world has worked for all of existence and it's like we we can actually rethink these things but that's a lot of work and that's like revolutionary change yeah to and it's hard to ask revolution of people and i think that's a great point it actually helps me tie it back into v v for vendetta because i think 
you know, part of the problem right now is people think, well, I need the cops because there's always going to be people wanting to come and steal my stuff or kill me or, or you know, do right. damage to me or whatever it is. And, you know, I, I think there's some truth to, like, I don't think we're ever going to completely obliterate crime whatsoever. But, you know, that I think that the idea that, like, you know, the amount of crime that we have is a product of, you know, a terrible socioeconomic situ- mm-hmm. situation and, like, lack of opportunities for other forms of, of existence and things like that. And that you can do things on that end, you know, it's kind yeah. of a supply-demand problem. Like, you can, right. like, do things to reduce the, the, the causes that drive people into crime and thus reduce the need for policing. But that's outside of most people's imagination until fairly recently. Yes. And that what V for Vendetta, what V does so well, you know, in that world... The idea of fighting back against the government is kind of outside most people's imagination. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a thing that I think most dictatorships do. Um, there's great political science about this. And I think I think actually, um, yeah, V says this. He says at one point, you know, people shouldn't be afraid of their government. The government mm. should be afraid of its people. Yeah. And like there's no government in the world that has ever been able to actually be in a situation where they say, if all of you rise up, we will kill all of you. Like, right. Did you, That's not a thing. The numbers don't work out. Yeah. But what you're going to say is, if you rise up, any of you may be killed, and you're yeah. all going to be so afraid of that that none of you will want to rise up. Exactly. And what V is able to get them to do is be like, no, don't believe that. You know, their it, mm-hmm. it's their power doesn't control you. Their your your fear your of fear. their power controls you. That's right. Um, and I think that's true in our own world. It's true very mm-hmm. much with in politics, with policing. You know, I mean, that's yeah. Um, you know, like even in the Star Wars universe, like if every planet in the Empire all at once said, you know, screw this, we're not supporting the Empire anymore, the Death Star couldn't go blow up all of them. Like, just, right. there's too many. There's thousands of them. Um, yeah. But the, the f- And then they'd have no stuff. Yeah. Like, you don't want to go around blowing up all your planets, right? That's where, where all your resources are. Like, yeah. why do you want the planet in the first place? Right. Probably to steal their resources. But Tarkin right? specifically says it's the fear will keep them in line. You know, right. it's that they're so afraid. Um, yeah, yeah. Other than V for Vendetta, can you think of other good and, and Cora? Can you think of other good examples where they really do get into this question of like what comes next that you can't just kill the kill the leader? You have to fix the system. Um, not off the top of my head. I, I see you have Endgame on uh, a list of examples. I'm I'm very curious what oh. uh... <laughs> Endgame was just there as an example of where, and I think this is mostly fictional that doesn't happen in real life, but a system where. As I was saying before, you kill the leader and everything does stop because right. you don't have like oh. five other people who are like, well, Thanos couldn't do it, but I can't wait to snap the gauntlet myself. Oh, that's um, what you meant by Thanos has no system. I thought, see, because I was thinking like Thanos has a system. His system is he goes to a place, he kills a whole bunch of people, and then there's less people there and somehow things are better, which right. that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> math, math doesn't add up. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think another interesting example of this Obviously, much less so, but it does kind of make the point. Um, is actually the first Iron Man movie, because one of the points there is that that here we have a system where you don't replace the person at the top; the person at the top just changes their mind. You know, Tony Stark is like, "Oh, this whole mm. weapons industry—it's wrong. I don't want to do it." And he kind of very naively says, "Okay, well, I'm in charge, so stop doing this." And what's pretty clear is that he doesn't even bother to check. He just is like, "I said it; it should be done now." Right. Um, and the whole point of the movie is that, and, and somewhat because of uh, Obadiah, but partly just because, you know, the shareholders want what they want and the manufacturers want, like, the whole industry, the whole system keeps chugging along. And he has to, yeah. um, and, I mean, the movie never talks about it, but like, okay, Obadiah's dead. The shareholders now are still just as interested in making the profits they made from selling weapons, you know? Right. Um, and they kind of get into that later uh, uh, Iron Man movies, but I think that's another interesting example of, like, where the system is and you can't just, you know kill the change the mind of the top person and kill the second person and think everything's going to change yeah i feel like stark industries does not really remain a character in uh future films like in the third one like he's at she's at the office right right but like and you know it's like oh she runs the business blah 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 but like do we know anything about like what the business does that much anymore like i feel like it's kind of almost written out i mean she is too a little bit at right. points in time um through the I, other movies i think we're supposed to think that they're no longer making weapons quite as much they're just making all the iron man suits and all that kind of stuff you know which is its own right. 
own thing to be sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, I think you said you had one kind of obscure example as well. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say Desperado, which we also did one of our earlier episodes oh, yeah. on. Um, Flinger of Bullets. Yes. Um, <laughs> like in El Mariachi, um, El Mariachi does, um, I guess he's not really a mariachi. Anyway. Um, oh, no, he is in Mariachi. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so in El Mariachi, <laughs> uh, the mariachi basically like defeats this one drug dealer who's like giving him a hard time and and shoots his hand and whatever bad things happen um but then like there's another one like above him right bucho and then he goes after him but then right. like there's there's like always more in like once upon a time in mexico and and um it's it's like uh i mean narcos also would be a sort of a similar example where it's yeah. like you know, there's one cartel, okay, they defeat, you know, they, they kill Pablo Escobar, but it's like, then there's the Cali cartel, and then they, you know, def, you know, get rid of the Cali cartel, and then there's, like, there's others, and then, you know, it and it, on the other side of the coin, too, it's like, with, you know, the, the DEA is, like, messing around with them in Mexico, and it's like, sure, you know, you can kill some of them, but it's like, then they're just going to keep coming back, like, right. um... <clears throat> Because as long as people want to buy the drugs, and as long as it's illegal to sell the drugs, you have to do it underground. Like, there's always going to be a multi-billion-dollar industry there. You exactly. Know? You have exactly. to address the industry. You have to address the problem. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't. I mean, in a larger sense, right? It's like you can't have a war on drugs. You can't have a war on terror. Like these yeah. things don't actually make sense because there's this idea, like, oh, the war on terror. Like they were going after Osama bin Laden, and they were going after you know, Saddam Hussein. And it's like, did that end terrorism? Like, yeah. that's that's not a thing, right? Like, it probably created more. Yeah. And it reminds me of all those movies I used to watch in the 80s, you know, that were always about, like, cops, you know, shooting the bad drug dealer to make everything right. okay. And it's like, yeah, right. there's just another one that's going to take over. Right. And it's like, you need to actually deal with what the problem is. I mean, first of all, you can put illegal drug dealers out of business by just making drugs legal. Right. Uh, <laughs> regulated. But also, you know... If you treat drug addiction, if you treat, you know, you you spend your money on education and on, um, you know, health care and mental health care instead of on just more cops and more cops and like bigger guns for cops. Like, right. Like as if they're I mean, when you tell cops that they're fighting a war on drugs, of course, they're going to behave like the military. Yeah. Right? Because there's always this idea of like. The war has to end somehow, you know, but like that's the idea. Right. Like you, you can fight a war against a nation. Yeah. Um, you can't fight a war against a concept like terror or war. Exactly. Um, and I think that's one of the things that like For to drugs. get put back to that, that something like Hydra really exploits, you know, yeah. um, because it's the idea of like if we keep you constantly at war, then by definition, we're winning, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that may be a kind of good good uh, place to start wrapping this up. Are there any kind of big other concepts or ideas you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to touch on or one more question you want to raise? Uh, no, that was that was mostly uh, – I, I think we, we touched on pretty much everything that I w had been thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd say that too. Um, great topic. I'm really glad you brought it up. I'm sure this is one that we're going to – like this level of analysis is one that I think I'm now going to think of in almost every movie I watch, you know, to kind of take a yeah. look at. Um, you know, how – well, oh, I have one. Oh, go I'm for sorry. it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I've been watching Cobra Kai. Okay. <laughs> and that could have its own episode, and I'm not going to, like, get too deep into it. And I don't know whether I, – it's kind of, like, in the theme. But, like so, – So explain to us what Cobra Kai is, for those of us who okay. may have no idea what you're talking about. All right. So there was a movie in the 80s. <laughs> there were three movies in the 80s called The Karate Kid. Um, and then there was another one in 2010, blah, blah, blah. Um, Cobra Kai is a show – based on, you know, the characters, you know, the principal protagonist and the principal antagonist from the Karate Kid movies, and or at least from the first one, and basically, like, what is it, 30-some years later, right? Right. And kind of like, you know, in the first movie, you know, there's a bully, and then there's a kid who's getting bullied, and he gets taught martial arts, and then he fights back and like he wins and he defeats the bully. But it's like, what happens after that? What happens to, you know, like 
martial arts are basically a system right or a system of systems and not not i don't mean like the, the way of fighting but sort of the culture and um you know just i in general like series and shows and whatever that come back to some previous material i find almost always disappointing mm -hmm. maybe it helps that like the karate kid wasn't like one of my favorite movies ever but um but it really actually does a i think a brilliant job of like coming back to this these characters and and kind of you know showing how there's like consequence and and like I don't know. Is this related? It felt related. It felt like really <laughs> related. And now it's feeling like more abstractly related. Um, but so I, I think the, the way, the way it relates is that in, um, kind of what we're talking about, we're talking about systems, but I think we're also talking about consequence, right? Like there's a goal that the heroes have and they achieve their goal. And yeah. then the question is like, what is the consequence of that achievement? Is right. it that everything's just good or like what happens after that? And, you know, in some stories we get to see that in the, in the legend of Korra, we get to see in season four, the fallout from season three. And in sim it's similarly in seasons three and four, we're seeing fallout from season two, a decision she made and things that happen in season two. Right. And the idea of a world really being changed by large events, I think is powerful. Um, but the idea that, you know, something might change something, but like it still might not, um, you might not get, you, you might not always get the change you hoped for. Yeah. You know, um, I think a lot of it also comes down to, and, and this is very, you know, controlled in a lot of ways by what your, what your perspective is, what your privilege is. It comes down to like, did you think that the world was fundamentally good and then this one bad person came around who made it bad. And if you kill the person, everything will go back to being good. Right. You know? And that's, I mean, that's a very popular understanding of the world, you know, especially when you have a very optimistic view. I think, you know, and in the 80s and 90s, that was very common. I think uh, certainly much more so, even more so in the 50s. Especially you know? in the 80s, yeah. yeah. 80s, 50s, yeah, you know? 20s. Um, yeah, very much so, you know. Um, now I think we have a much darker view and there's much more of an understanding of, like, Yep, yeah, racism is a thing in our world. Misogyny is a thing in our world. Capitalism and like the the evils of um, capitalist exploitation. You know, even if you're not like uh, quite as you know lefty as me, like I think a lot of us are like, yeah, income in disparity is a big problem, and yeah. you can't, you know, you you might have a movie about like a ruthless billionaire, and like you know our heroes like get the billionaire arrested or like fight him in, in the streets or whatever it is and take care of him, but the system that creates that person is still there. You know, right. um, you know, if if Donald Trump is defeated, like in, in the fall, you know, pray God, that's great. We still live in a country with 40 million, 40 million Americans who thought that that the hate he was doing was a good part of the country. You know, like yeah, yeah. that we're going to have to deal with that. Um, yeah. and, and I think because of that, um, you know, these movies don't totally change things, but they definitely have an effect on us. And I think certainly a lot of my. I grew up really thinking that, you know, if we could just take care of the bad guy, everything would be okay. And I probably got that from a lot of these movies. And I'm, mm. I'm glad that we're now seeing a lot more movies and TV shows that are really challenging that. You know, really saying, like, yeah, you can, you can kill the bad guy. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's one of the reasons why I love the TV show The Mandalorian so much. Because mm -hmm. it's about a world in which everything worked out. Everything was good. Uh, we won. We defeated the Emperor. But now five years later... Um, you know, we're back to having problems. And then as the sequels show 20 years later, 30 years later, an empire tech group is going to rise again because people are dissatisfied. You know, people want, right. uh, I think it's Hux who says it, but one of them definitely says, you know, like the Republic isn't in control. There's too much chaos. There's too much confusion. That's why mm -hmm. we, you need us. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would say like, well, just it, in reference to the, the billionaire thing, like, you know, a, every billionaire is a, a policy failure, not a supervillain necessarily. Although some of them are definitely supervillains. Everyone, like, what would you say? They're not a, they're not a supervillain. They're a what? Policy failure. Oh, yeah. I think that's very true. That's that's a, that's a I think that's an AOC quote. Yeah. Uh, but like, 
Yeah, I, I think there, there's definitely a lot of people who look at the world right now and are like, oh, things were, like, great four years ago. Let's just go back to that. Yeah. And, like, I mean, I don't know. I, I've, I've never looked at the world and been like, oh, yeah, this is good, you know. I mean, like, I enjoy life and I think people can be capable of great um, compassion, great, great caring and love. But I think people just historically have just done horrible things often when acting in groups and often by building systems that have served very often served some positive, constructive, very clear purpose, right? Like, like Amazon has a very clear purpose. It does a thing right? and it does it very well. But the problem is it does that thing that well by exploiting a lot of people. And the, the thing is like, if you just got rid of even, even forget Jeff Bezos, if you just got rid of Amazon, it's like, there would just be another company yeah. doing something similar, right? Like in communications and media, there's like five companies that own, I think it, it's something like 80 to 80% of the market share or something ridiculous. Right. If you, you know, if you look at tech, there's like five giant companies and you know, you, you need to actually change systems in order to like, you can't just do things directly to these individuals or individual companies. Um, and it, it, it just, I don't know. I think systems, people build systems and then they outlast them. Mm -hmm. the, the systems outlast the people and then the systems kind of get away from people, I think. Yeah. And I definitely err more on the side, the side of Zaheer. Uh, <laughs> you know, and like, and V, yeah. uh, hopefully maybe a little more V because I, I really honestly, like, I would like everybody or like hundreds of millions or billions of people worldwide to just be like, fuck this. Yeah. Like, and if, if like everybody did, if like 90% of people were just like, no, no, we're not going to continue just going along with things as they are day after day, um, then then things would change. Things yeah. would have to change because the power comes from the sort of consent that's not really consent. Yeah. But that's like not, I mean, when people, use, I don't want to go down too far this road, but like when people use the phrase silence is violence, like mm -hmm. I really understand and appreciate the thought behind that message, right? That mm -hmm. is, if you are not objecting to oppression, you are to an extent facilitating it. Right. And I think there's truth there, but at the same time, silence is not consent. Yeah. Right. And so like not speaking out against a thing that's wrong, it's a combination of like, you're not doing something positive to oppose it, but like you also quite likely are afraid of the consequence of that. And that fear is not entirely unfounded, right? Like if everybody spoke up at the same time, which to some extent is happening now, mm -hmm. right? We've had these wonderful movements of masses of people actually speaking up at the same time and there's real power there um but it needs to be more and uh it's just it, you know that idea of non-violent like if everybody in the world went on strike and was like no we're not going to continue with things the way they are things would have to change I, because the people yeah i mean that has happened you know many many times yes. that's you know no, that, that's yeah. how that's how things get done but it's yeah you're right it's, it's that fear aspect that that really stops it um and and because if only a few people do it or some people do it and it's not quite enough and there's too many people who are like no you know i'm gonna i'm gonna break the strike line or whatever it's like then it doesn't work and the people who made the effort generally suffer for for that effort it, it's funny just carrying that thought a little bit further and, and just doing one more of those like where you want a superhero story to reflect real life. Because um, yeah. I'm thinking about how now what happens a lot is we, you know, everyone says, oh, I want people to stand up and fight for this, but not that way. You know, oh, I don't yeah, want yeah. you to kneel for the flag or I don't want you to like, you know, <laughs> ever like break a window or, you know, throw right. a rock. You know, I, I want you yeah. to protest in the right way. I'd love to see. And I think we have seen this somewhat um, a little bit. Luke Cage, I think there's some of this. Um, but I really would love to see something where it's all about a hero coming along, but everyone being like, eh, I really don't want you to fight for justice that way. You know, I wish you just do it this way or like do it this right. way. Um, your way of fighting for justice makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and actually that, that to tie it way back, that was one more point I wanted to make. And I think, um, 
there, there's some show, shows that have gotten into this, but I'm having tr- uh, I think actually Altered Carbon does in, in some interesting ways. I haven't uh, seen it. Okay. But, well, the idea is that, like, it's not just that your silence – we were talking before about, like, the idea of, like, getting everyone to realize the problem and how much people don't want to recognize that. Yeah. Part of that's, I think, because they don't want to recognize how they're complicit in it, you know? Sure. Um, yeah. You know, it's a whole idea of like, yes, you know, I want to fight global warming and I also drive my car everywhere. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, all of us could drive our cars 25 percent as much as we currently do. It barely make a dent in what consumer, you know, co- you know, massive corporations do in terms of global right. warming. Right. But still, anyway, and, and I think that's one more challenge to the like. All of us look at the system. You know, it, it, it's very easy to say, like, that racist is bad. Let's go punch a Nazi. Let's go arrest the KKK yeah, yeah. leader. It's a lot harder to say, like, how are we all complicit in this? Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I think these are good questions, good topics, good things that I think we really like for our, um, our stories to examine. And I'm glad that, um, you know, as I think superhero movies and TV shows are, I wouldn't say for the first time, you know, doing this. Um, I recently did an episode on the history of comic books where we talked about, like, I didn't realize that the original Superman – the, the probably the kind of like bad guy he goes up against most often in the very early episodes is yeah. la- is landlords who are exploiting <laughs> or like a couple times like it's like yeah. uh company bosses who are busting unions you know i mean superman right. was very socialist in the yeah, 1930s yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so i think there's always been this but i think it's just great that we're seeing more of it so yeah. um i mean his nemesis was a billionaire right yeah I mean, exa- a exactly a, a millionaire back then before people yeah, could even yeah. conceive a billionaire right. um but yeah, so to our fans, what what are your thoughts? What are um, if you've seen Cora, especially, would love to hear what you think. But for any of these, um, what do you want to just see people punch the bad guy and leave that because you know all the social justice stuff? It, it, I mean, I think it's perfectly fair to say I just want a movie where the bad guy gets punched and everything's okay. That, there's something satisfying about that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fine. There's um uh in the TV show uh, Babylon Five, fairly obscure, but one of my absolute favorites. There's a wonderful line where um. The character Jakar is dealing with these kind of problems and he's dealing with like the the intractableness of corruption on his own world and attempting to fight for political freedom and, and economic freedom while not just replicating dictatorship. And he gets caught up in this like street fight thing where he's just like punching bad guys. And, and he says one of my favorite lines in all of TV and their bodies made a very satisfying thump when they hit the floor. You know, like, I like that idea. Like, there's something about, like, you know what? We, we, we killed the bad guy. We punched the bad guy. It's over. I'm satisfied. Uh, they made a good thump when they hit the floor. Um, but, like, you know, if you like that, you write and tell us. I think that's a fair perspective. If, if you're more where we're coming from, if you want to see more stories about the consequences, what, what are some of your favorite examples? Um, Paul and I came up with this great idea and then went totally blank. We were trying to think of more examples <laughs> beyond the three or four we came in with. But well, I know that was the point. Yeah, exactly. There, there's so many. What do you all no. think? No. Oh, oh, I thought I meant the point was that there's not enough of them. Oh, yeah. Of, of show the, the ones yeah. on that side. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. Um, but yeah, what do you all think? Um, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, or email. All the information you can find if you go to strandedpanda.com and click on Superhero Ethics. Um, all our contact information is there. While you're there, you can check out also some other great podcasts from the Superhero Ethics Podcast Network. Um, this Friday, September 4th, uh, the first episode of the second season of The Boys will be coming out. And myself, Jeff Randall, and Matthew Carroll will be um, podcasting about those episodes as they come out, uh, one for each episode. Um, very different kind of a superhero story, but also another one that really gets into some great questions and a lot of ethics and morality of what happens when people have power and, and how... I mean, the whole thing is about uh, a system, you know, and the system of this company that's kind of bigger than any one person. Um, so yeah, check all those out. Let us know what you think. Uh, if you like this podcast, great things you can do is write us a five-star review or however many stars you think we deserve, and especially share it with a friend. You know, if you enjoy these kind of conversations with friends, tell them, hey, check this out. Let's talk about it together. It's a great way to help build a podcast and bring more of these conversations into your life. So I'm going to have myself, Paul, everybody else. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Have a great day. <laughs>